So Peter Jackson adapted a lot of characters for his Lord of the Rings movies, but he didn't adapt all of them. Maya Gavan and Melanine, and welcome to Tolkien Untangled's top 10 list of Lord of the Rings characters who didn't make it into the movies. And to be fair, in pretty much every case here, I do understand why these characters were cut, but I also want to take this opportunity to give a little bit of love to 10 wonderful heroes that film fans may not yet be fully familiar with. Number 10. Fredegar Fatty Bulger, aka the Fifth Hobbit. So, Frodo, Sam, Merry, and Pippin have got to be four of the most iconic names in all of the Lord of the Rings, but there was a time when Fredegar could have been counted among them. So, Fredegar Bulger, known perhaps a little insultingly as Fatty Bulger, was a friend of Frodo's and a guest at Frodo and Bilbo's long expected birthday party, but there is more to Fredegar than that. He was one of the four self-described conspirators who discovered that Frodo was planning to leave the Shire in secret and he began working to assist him without Frodo knowing that he knew. And along with his fellow conspirator Merry, the one who first figured out that there was something dodgy going on with Bilbo's ring, Fredegar left Hobbiton with Frodo's belongings and right at the beginning of the story he sets up Frodo's new home in Crick Hollow. And although this Crick Hollow storyline is completely absent from the movies, it is an important part of Frodo's quest. A major theme in the first part of the first book is secrecy. And unlike in the movies, Frodo doesn't just up and leave one day, he tells everyone, including his friends, that he's moving across the Brandywine River to the semi-independent hobbit community of Buckland. And there he claims he's planning to stay. Now, of course, as it goes, the four conspirators have already figured out that Frodo is being uh, economical with the truth, let's say, and we all know that Sam, Merry, and Pippin insist on accompanying him into the wilds of the Old Forest, but Fredegar Bolger has an important role to fulfil too. It is Fredegar's duty to remain in Crick Hollow, and to keep up this pretense that Frodo Baggins is still living in Buckland. And because of this deception, the Nazgul are for a while fooled. Fredegar buys Frodo valuable time that in the grand scheme of things may very well have contributed to Sauron's eventual downfall. If the Nazgul had been searching the wilds instead of Crick Hollow, perhaps the ring would have been reclaimed by Sauron before the hobbits even got a chance to meet Strider. And this isn't even the end of Fredegar's involvement in the story. On the very same night that the Prancing Pony is attacked in Bree, many many miles away, another group of Nazgul come to Crick Hollow. But thanks to the actions of Fredegar Bolger, they are repelled. So, I find this pretty awesome, because Fredegar is by no means a conventional hero, he's really not that brave, and he's not a warrior, and yet he does have a moment of relative badassery. I mean, it's not quite Merry slaying the Witch King, but it is something. So, when the Nazgul come to Crick Hollow, Fredegar runs away. But despite his fear, he does raise the alarm and he rallies the hobbits of Buckland against the invading Nazgul. Tolkien writes that Fatty Bulger had not been idle. As soon as he saw the dark shapes creep from the garden, he knew that he must run for it or perish. And run he did, out of the back door, through the garden, and over the fields. When he reached the nearest house more than a mile away, he collapsed on the doorstep. So that's not unimpressive. A guy who is pretty universally known as Fatty sprints over a mile in the dark to warn his neighbours about the strange invasion. And thanks to Fredegar's warning, the hobbits of Buckland blow horns that had not sounded for a hundred years. And from the darkness come more hobbit horns, and the call goes up, and eventually the Nazgul flee thanks to Fredegar. Now, throughout most of the rest of The Lord of the Rings, Fredegar sits out the action off page, but he does come back in a significant way towards the ending. We are told that when Saruman's ruffians first came to the Shire and they polluted it, 
Fredegar Bolger led a hobbit resistance, and he fought against them in the East Farthing, but he was captured by Saruman's agents and imprisoned in a series of tunnels called the Lockholes. There, Fredegar was starved, to such an extent that he was no longer fat, and his nickname Fatty no longer applied. We are told that after the Battle of Bywater, Frodo and friends rode to the Lockholes and released the Hobbit prisoners, and there they found Fredegar too weak to walk. But when Pippin carries him outside, he opened an eye and tried gallantly to smile. Who's this young giant with the loud voice, he whispered, not little Pippin. And I just think this is such a lovely moment. Fredegar Bolger strikes me as so ordinary, and yet at the same time so extraordinary. If hobbits represent the quiet courage found in everyday people, then I think Fredegar Bolger is one of the chief examples of that. His heroism isn't quite as flashy as Frodo's or Sam's, but the case can certainly be made that the reason those central heroes are able to succeed is because they are standing on the shoulders of other heroes in the background. Heroes like Fredegar Bolger. Number 9. Gan Burigan. So, Gan Burigan is the leader of the Druidine, the woodland woesers who aid Theoden's Rohirrim in their ride to Minas Tirith in Return of the King. And the reason that I like Gan Burigan and his people so much is because they are so different to any other men that we see in The Lord of the Rings. When Theoden brings his riders to the Druidan forest, which they must pass through on their way to the fields of Pelennor, they encounter these strange, stunted people who seem to be enemies of both Sauron and the Rohirrim. They are a very isolationist group who fear outsiders, and they have a pretty fraught relationship with the men of Rohan. In fact, Tolkien tells us that the Rohirrim once hunted the Druidine for sport. However, due to the friendship that was forged between King Theoden and Gan Burigan, the Druidine agree to lead the Riders of Rohan through a secret pass called the Stonewain Valley. And because of this, the Rohirrim were able to avoid the patrols of orcs that blocked the main road to Pelennor Fields, and they arrived just in time to save Minas Tirith, and when they did, the orcs had no idea they were coming. This is due to Gan Burigan and his people. In return for their aid, Theoden swore that Gan Burigan and the Druidine would never again be troubled by the Rohirrim, and when the War of the Ring was finally over, the newly crowned Aragorn decreed that the Druidan forest would belong exclusively to the Druidine for the rest of time, and that no other men were ever permitted to enter the forest without the permission of Gan Burigan and his descendants. Such was his reward for playing a small but incredibly important role in ensuring the ultimate downfall of Sauron. Just like Fredegar Bolger, Gan Burigan is a minor hero who paves the way for the much more famous heroes to do their thing. Number 8. Beragond. So, Beragond is a man of Minas Tirith. He's a warrior, a member of the Guard of the Citadel, who protected the Tower of Ecthelion, the White Tree of Gondor, and the Houses of the Steward. And he had a deep love and admiration for Faramir. Now, we first meet Beragond when Pippin becomes an honorary guard of the Citadel too, as it is Beragond who helps him learn the ropes. And it's really lovely, because we are told that Beragond had never met a hobbit before, and so he finds Pippin fascinating. And Pippin also develops a really nice relationship with Beragond's ten-year-old son, Beragil. However, Beragond's main action in The Lord of the Rings comes after Faramir is wounded, and in his madness Denethor tries to burn him alive. And so, Beragond is forced to make an incredibly difficult choice. On the one hand, he's a guard of the Citadel, and so leaving his post during the Battle of Pelennor Fields would be tantamount to desertion. But on the other hand, 
he loves Faramir. And so Beregond decides to disobey his orders and to go with Pippin and Gandalf to Faramir's rescue. But this is where things get quite dark. In order to reach Faramir, they must first enter the holy silent street of Minas Tirith. But this street is guarded by Beregond's brothers in arms, the guards of Denethor. And so Beregond is forced to kill these men in order for Gandalf and Pippin to pass. And during the whole pyre of Denethor scene, two more guards are slain, which we are told Beregond deeply regretted, but he did what he had to. In fact, when Denethor drew a knife and tried to kill Faramir himself, Beragon stepped between his captain and his steward, which from Denethor's perspective is straight up treason. And so this makes Beragond a really complex character. He is a thoroughly good guy, but he's put in a position where he's forced to do evil. Spilling blood on the hallowed ground of the silent street carries the death penalty. And it wasn't just random people that Beragond killed, not that that would be okay, but it was Gondorian guards, guards just like him. And yet, if he hadn't done it, Faramir would surely have died. Now, Beragond does also fight alongside his buddy Pippin in the Battle of the Black Gate, and there he is very nearly killed by a troll, but his life is saved by Pippin. And the conclusion of Beragond's character arc comes after Sauron is overthrown and Aragorn is crowned king. Because the question of what to do with Beragond is the first moral dilemma that Aragorn has to face. He knows as well as anyone else that under the law, Beragond has earned the death penalty, and yet Aragorn shows mercy. And he comes up with a pretty perfect punishment. So Beragond is stripped of his position among the guards of the citadel, and he's straight up banished from Minas Tirith for life. But he's also given a promotion. Ardagorn decrees that Beragond shall be made the captain of the guard of Faramir, also called the White Company, and he will move to Ithilien with his beloved lord, where he'll live the rest of his life in Emin Arinen with Prince Faramir of Ithilien and his wife the Lady Eowyn. And just one more thing before we move on, in Tolkien's abandoned sequel to The Lord of the Rings, which he called A New Shadow, one of the main characters is a Gondorian guy called Borlas, and Borlas is the second son of Beragond. Number 7. Tom Bombadil. Okay, you knew this was coming. No list of characters missing from the movies could possibly be complete without the greatest enigma in the story, the Middle-earth equivalent of Marmite, Tom Bombadil. And I don't have anywhere near enough time in this video to go down the whole rabbit hole of who or what Tom Bombadil is. Check out this video if you want to learn more about that. But more so than most characters on this list, Tom Bombadil does actually get quite a lot of page time in the books. Three consecutive chapters, in fact, in which he plays a very significant role. And of course, all three of these chapters are completely cut from Peter Jackson's movies, but they are a really great part of the story. And although Tom Bombadil is kind of the focal point that these three chapters all revolve around, they do also feature quite a few other characters, all of whom have a fairly unique relationship with this massively mysterious character. On the benign side of things, there is of course Tom Bombadil's wife, the river daughter Goldberry. And on the more hostile side, there is the potential Huorn, or possibly even a dark Ent, Old Man Willow, and the terrifying Barrow White, who comes close to derailing the entire quest. And as I say, Tom Bombadil is a bit of a Marmite character. Some fans absolutely love him, others less so. And I think I find myself, once again, in the middle. I do love Tom Bombadil. I think he's a wonderful part of the story, and I'm so glad that Tolkien included him, but I'm also kind of glad that Peter Jackson didn't. I mean, he'd be very difficult to capture well on screen, I think, and if there's not enough time in the film to properly explore either the old forest or the Barrow Downs, then there's just not enough time to do Tom Bombadil justice. 
But a question that I hear asked quite a lot by some of Tom Bombadil's critics is what role does he really serve in the story? I mean, obviously he saves the hobbits from Old Man Willow and then he helps out again against the Barrow White, but why did Tolkien stop the adventure in its tracks only one chapter after leaving Crick Hollow to give us a whole chapter in the house of Tom Bombadil? Well, I can only answer this question from my own perspective, I have no idea how Tolkien would answer that question, but when reading the Tom Bombadil chapters, I am struck by a really interesting piece of Frodo's character development that I think makes him all the more enjoyable. Because if we look at the quest from Frodo's perspective, when he arrives in the house of Tom Bombadil, he has a harsh reality to face up to. Gandalf entrusted Frodo with this massively important ring. The wandering elves gave him their friendship and protection, and he knows that there is so much riding on him, but he also knows that he and his friends have all just fallen at the first hurdle. Literally, the day they leave Crick Hollow, on their first day in the wild, Frodo almost drowns and Merry and Pippin are almost killed by a tree. The only reason they live to see day two is because of Tom Bombadil. So, in the house of Tom Bombadil, Frodo must be feeling like he's very much out of his depth and he may not have what it takes. But then he learns that Tom Bombadil is seemingly unaffected by the One Ring. This is Frodo's opportunity to call it a day. Surely he must have been tempted to just hand off the ring to Tom and return to the comfort of Crick Hollow. Tom Bombadil seems like a great alternative to the danger that lies ahead. He represents the safe choice and the easy choice, but we know it's not the right choice. And on the night before they leave, Frodo has the dream. He sees a grey rain curtain and a veil of silver glass. But then all is rolled back and a far green country opened before him under a swift sunrise. And of course, in the movie, this language is given to Gandalf. And the context is changed a little bit. Gandalf is talking about death in the movies. But in the books, this isn't a dream about dying. It's a prophetic vision of the future. Frodo will one day sail into the west and the veil of silver glass will fall back and he will literally see a far green country under a swift sunrise but not if he turns back to Crick Hollow. Then Frodo wakes. He hears Tom whistling, he eats breakfast, and within two short paragraphs, he sets off on the road that will take him all the way to Mordor. And that is why I think Tom Bombadil works so well in the books. That is his point in the story, at least in my opinion. He's not just a whimsical side character, I mean, he is that too, but he is a profound part of Frodo's personal journey. Frodo is a different character after his encounter with Tom. And although this chapter is the last time that we see Tom Bombadil in the flesh, he does get another mention right at the end of the story. Also, he is mentioned during the Council of Elrond. But seven months after the ring is destroyed, after Aragorn's crowned king and the hobbits make the homeward journey, Gandalf takes his leave of them at the Brandywine Bridge, and he goes off on his own to visit the house of Tom Bombadil for what Gandalf describes as a long talk. And this could well be a very long talk indeed, as the next time that Gandalf shows up in the Hobbit's lives is two years later. And although we know nothing of what Gandalf and Tom Bombadil talked about, I would give anything to be a fly on the wall during this potentially two year long chat between Gandalf the White and Jolly Tom Bombadillo. Number 6. Gildor in Glorion. So, Gildor in Glorion is one of a few elves who appears for one chapter in the Fellowship of the Ring and then isn't ever seen again, at least not until the very end of the Grey Havens. 
But Gildor is a wonderful addition to the story. And one of the reasons that I enjoy him so much boils down to when in the story we meet him. Obviously, in the movies, there is an extended scene where Frodo and Sam chance upon a group of wandering elves before they even leave the Shire, but in the theatrical release, we don't meet any elves outside of the prologue until Arwen shows up at Weathertop. But in the books, the first elf we ever meet is Gildor in Glorion. And I think this character is a wonderful way of opening up the world in which this story takes place. In the first two chapters of The Lord of the Rings, we start real small. We meet hobbits in the Shire, and we meet Gandalf, but he's just some mysterious wizard at this point. The full extent of what makes him special isn't revealed until quite a bit later. And we also meet the Ringwraiths, but again, at first they are just mysterious riders in black. But then, in chapter 3, we meet Gilidor in Glorion and we learn that there are much larger wheels moving in this world. And Gildor in Glorion isn't just some wandering wood elf, he's a really big deal. He is one of the High Elves, one of the exiles who probably journeyed from the uttermost west into Middle-earth during the First Age. He describes himself as being of the House of Fenrod Felagund which implies he was probably an elf of Nargothrond back in the First Age. He may even have been present in the background during the great First Age tales of Beren and Luthien or the children of Húrin. And it's very possible he may have fought in the great battles of the First Age against the first Dark Lord, Morgoth. Whatever his origins, by the time of the Lord of the Rings, Gildor in Glorion must be truly ancient and he must be one of the last few First Age Elves of the West left in Middle-earth. I guess he's up there with like Galadriel or Glorfindel. And although he's not in the story for a huge amount of time, Gildor in Glorion is such a positive figure in the first stage of Frodo's quest. He and his company ward off the Nazgul with their elven music, and when Frodo tries out an elvish saying that Bilbo taught him in his youth, Gildor in Glorion laughs, and he says to Frodo, Here is a scholar in the ancient tongue. Hail, elf friend. And I think being given the title elf friend this early on is a huge deal for Frodo. It's a reminder to both him and the reader that although enemies lie behind and in front and on either side, there are friends too. There are powerful beings working off-page to guide and aid our heroes. There's a lot more going on in Middle-earth than the story we see through Frodo's eyes, and Gildor in Glorion is our first hint at that. Number 5. Eladan and Elrohir and also Halibarad and the Grey Company. So here's a bit of a three for one, Eladan and Elrohir and Halibarad. And I'll start with the Elven twins, Eladan and Elrohir, the sons of Elrond and the brothers of Arwen. So unlike many of the elves that I could have talked about on this list, Eladan and Elrohir actually do come back into the story after being introduced in the Fellowship of the Ring. But when we first meet them, it is in Rivendell, after the Council of Elrond. And before the Fellowship sets out on their quest, Eladan and Elrohir scout out the roads ahead, and they basically undertake the first stage of the Fellowship's journey. They pass over the Misty Mountains and travel down the Silverload River to the realm of their grandparents, Galadriel and Celeborn. But in the appendices, we learn that Eladan and Elrohir were an important part of the story long before Frodo acquired the One Ring. During the youth of Aragorn, before Aragorn even met their sister Arwen, Eladan and Elrohir lived with him in Rivendell, and young Aragorn even accompanied them on their hunts. In fact, Eladan and Elrohir also fought alongside Aragorn's father, Arda Thorn, and they were present in the battle in which he died. It seems Eladan and Elrohir have spent hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years fighting alongside the Rangers of the North, the descendants of the Dúnedain of Arnor. 
And this relationship with the Dúnedain is a very important part of why Eladan and Elorhir do eventually return into the story in Return of the King. In the movies, it is Elrond who comes to Aragorn and urges him to take the paths of the dead, but in the books it is Eladan and Elrohir. And when they meet Aragorn, the elven twins are accompanied by 30 rangers of the north, 30 Dúnedain, who call themselves the Grey Company. And these rangers are led by a kinsman of Aragorn's called Halbarad. And throughout most of the rest of the story, Eladan and Elrohir and the Grey Company accompany Aragorn and Legolas and Gimli through the paths of the dead. They accompany him on his journey through the outlands of Gondor, they fight with him at the Battle of Pelagia, and they sail with him to Minas Tirith to fight in the Battle of Pelennor Fields. And in that battle, Halbarad is slain. But Eladan and Elrohir are not. They fight with Aragorn again at the Battle of the Black Gate. And after that, they are the ones who escort their sister Arwen to Minas Tirith the day before she marries Aragorn. Number 4. Lobelia Sackville Baggins Alright, this may seem like a bit of an odd choice to place so highly on this list, and of course Lobelia Sackville Baggins does briefly appear at the beginning of the first movie, but the reason I want to talk about her, the reason I find her such a wonderful character, comes at the end of the story. Because although Lobelia Sackville Baggins is portrayed as a fairly antagonistic hobbit, and in her first appearance she is far from a likeable character, I would actually argue that this old hobbit lady has one of the best redemption arcs in the entire legendarium. She is up there with Boromir in my mind. So when we first meet Lobelia, she is known for her greed and her bad temper and her coveting of Bag End. Also, she straight up stole a load of Bilbo's silver spoons, so I guess by Hobbit standards that kind of makes her a hardened criminal. But then the story leaves the Shire and we don't return until the very end. And by the time that we do see the Shire and specifically Lobelia again, everything has changed. As you probably know, Saruman's ruffians invaded the Shire while our Hobbit heroes were away, and they did many terrible things before the Shire was finally scoured of their presence. And during this dark period in the Shire's history, there were a few Hobbits who actually collaborated with the enemy and kind of betrayed their own people. And one of these collaborators was Lotho Sackville Baggins, Lobelia's son. Now, Lotho is a pretty despicable hobbit. He used the ruffians to seize power from the Shire's rightful mayor, and he had him imprisoned in those same lock holes as Fredegar Bolger. He began calling himself the Chief, although the other hobbits called him Pimple, and he got rich carting the Shire's produce away to Isengard. Although, to be fair, things didn't actually work out very well for Lotho in the long run. When Saruman arrived in the Shire, he supplanted Lotho as chief, and we're even told that Saruman ordered Grima Wormtongue to murder Lotho in his sleep. But despite all of these shady goings on, Lobelia Sackville Baggins was not complicit in her son's treachery. In fact, Lobelia set herself in open opposition to the ruffians who spoiled her home. We are told that she was eventually imprisoned in the Lockholes too, but the reason for her incarceration is so utterly badass. Get this, when Lotho's ruffians came to argue with Lobelia, she attacked one of them and beat him with her umbrella. Which I'm aware may not be quite as like jaw-dropping as Gandalf taking down the Balrog or Samwise taking down Shelob, but in the world of Lobelia Sackville Baggins, beating a ruffian with an umbrella seems every bit as epic. And after this, she is, for the first time in her life, a popular figure in the Shire. When our Hobbit hero storm the lockholes and release the prisoners, she is welcomed by clapping and cheering. But, to be honest, after her imprisonment, Lobelia's life is really quite sad. 
Frodo finds Lobelia old and frail. And despite his many sins, she is crushed to learn of her son's murder. Instead of returning to her rightful home of Bag End, she gives it freely back to Frodo. And she leaves Hobbiton to return to her family in the town of Hardbottle. And only a few months later, she dies. But in her last will, Lobelia leaves all of her and Lotho's wealth to Frodo so that he may use the money to help the hobbits who were made homeless by Saruman. And so, right at the end of the story, Lobelia Sackville Baggins gets her redemption. The formerly greedy, snobby, covetous thief dies a hero. And in no small part due to her generosity, the Shire is made right again. All hail Lobelia Sackville Baggins. Number 3. Glorfindel. Surely all of you guys knew Glorfindel would have to appear near the top of this list. He is probably the most iconic of all the characters that Tolkien wrote and Peter Jackson left out. And there's a very good reason for this. Glorfindel is the very definition of epic. And I don't really have time to go into all the reasons why Glorfindel is so great and all the incredible things he did throughout the first age, but I do already have a video all about that, so check this out after this video if you want to learn more. Anyway, the one thing I will say right now is that Glorfindel is utterly unique for being the only elf to die in Middle-earth, but then be sent back to Middle-earth to live again, with even more power than he ever had before. In fact, the only other character who does anything like this in the entire Legendarium is of course Gandalf the White, who just like Glorfindel returns to Middle-earth with a power upgrade after dying at the hands of a Balrog. And the reason that Glorfindel was sent back to Middle-earth is because he has a task to accomplish, a destiny to fulfil. And that destiny is the one thing that he does in The Lord of the Rings, getting Frodo to Rivendell. Now, obviously, this role in the movies was given to Arduin, and I understand the reasons behind that, but I couldn't possibly go through this list without talking about Glorfindel. Because, as I just said, Glorfindel returns to Middle-earth with way more power than he ever had before. And we're told that this isn't really elven power that he's endowed with, Glorfindel returns as an emissary of the Valar. He is able to walk in both the seen and the unseen worlds, which gives him a great advantage over the Nazgul. And as Frodo slips into the unseen world, the Wraith world, he sees Glorfindel for what he is in that world, a being of pure white light. If not for Glorfindel and his horse Asphaloth, I truly believe the quest would have failed. Frodo would not have made it to Rivendell, and Aragorn alone would not have been strong enough to hold off the nine united Nazgul. But luckily, he doesn't have to. Because thousands of years ago, Glorfindel returned from the uttermost west for the sole purpose of ensuring that the ring and its bearer would eventually make it to Rivendell, on the day that it counted most. Now, honestly, Glorfindel does very little else in The Lord of the Rings. He's quite a big part of the Council of Elrond, and he does show up right at the end at Aragorn and Arwen's wedding, but other than that, no tales tell of Glorfindel's other contributions to The War of the Ring. But while we're on the topic of him and the Nazgul, I will point out that over a thousand years before The Lord of the Rings, it was of course Glorfindel who uttered the iconic line about the Witch King of Angmar. Far off yet is his doom, and not by the hand of man shall he fall. That was first spoken by Glorfindel, 1044 years before Eowyn and Merry would make it come true. Number 2. Beregalad, aka Quickbeam. So, in the movies, we get to see a good few Ents, and we spend a lot of time with Treebeard, but one character we don't get to see is Quickbeam. 
And the reason I love Quickbeam so much is that he's so different from all the other Ents. We are told that Quickbeam is a young Ent, and he is uncharacteristically hasty by the standards of his people. In fact, he acquired the name Quickbeam after answering yes to an old Ent before the question had finished being asked. And Quickbeam also seems to have such a wonderful personality. His main role in the story is befriending Merry and Pippin at the Entmoot and taking them back to his Ent house while the other Ents discuss what to do with Saruman. Turns out, Quickbeam, being a hasty Ent, has already made his decision to march on Isengard, and so he has no interest in waiting for the others to make up their minds. And while Quickbeam walks the forests with Merry and Pippin, we are told that he sang and he often laughed. He laughed when the sun came out from behind a cloud, he laughed when they came upon a stream or a spring, and he laughed at the whispers of the trees. Quickbeam strikes me as such a joyous, almost childlike character that makes him such a wonderful friend to Merry and Pippin, and it also contrasts him greatly with the other much more ancient Ents like Treebeard. However, despite Quickbeam's joyful nature and his love of singing and laughing, he actually has a pretty tragic backstory. You see, Quickbeam's favourite trees are the Rowan trees, and he tells us that the very first Rowans were planted by the Ents to try and please the Ent wives. However, Rowan trees are part of the Rose family, and the Entwise laughed at the Ent, saying they knew where whiter blossoms and richer fruits were growing. But Quickbeam disagreed with the Entwives. He tells Merry and Pippin that of all the trees of the Rose family, it is the humble Rowan that is most beautiful to him. And so, Quickbeam had in his grove many Rowan friends, and he called to his favourites by name. But then the birds of Isengard came, and they were unfriendly and greedy, and they tore at the leaves and threw the fruit down to waste and rot on the ground. And after the birds came the orcs, with axes. They cut down Quickbeam's trees, and when he came home to call them by their names, they did not answer him. They were dead. Quickbeam sings Merry and Pippin a song about his beloved rowan trees, and he ends it with this. O rowan dead, upon your head your hair is dry and grey, your crown is spilled, your voice is stilled forever and a day. But the feel-good part of the story is that Quickbeam certainly gets the last laugh. Not only does Saruman utterly fail to destroy this young Ent's joyful nature, but this young Ent is among those that absolutely obliterate all of Saruman's designs. In fact, during the attack on Isengard, Quickbeam is the first Ent to spot Saruman amid the chaos, and he gives out a cry, the Tree Killer. Quickbeam moved like the wind to see Saruman, and he was so hot after him that Saruman was within a step or two of being caught and strangled when he slipped to safety behind the doors of Orthanc. And after this, we don't really see Quickbeam again. But despite not appearing in The Return of the King, he is a character that I find myself thinking about quite a lot. Throughout all the rest of Merry and Pippin's adventures, their old young friend Quickbeam is just chilling in Isengard and returning it to how it should have been. He's planting trees again. Number 1. Prince Imrahil So, Prince Imrahil is the brother of Denethor's late wife, which of course means he is the uncle of Boromir and Faramir. But unlike those guys, Prince Imrahil does not live in Minas Tirith. Instead, he rules the coastal region of Belfalas from his swan city of Dol Amroth. And in order to fully understand Prince Imrahil, we first need to understand the geography of Gondor. Because this is of course not Gondor, this is Minas Tirith, a chief city of Gondor, the capital of Gondor, but Gondor is a whole country with lots and lots of different regions and settlements. 
And one of the absolute coolest parts of Gondor is the coastal fiefdom of Dol Amroth. And what makes Dol Amroth so special is that long before Gondor was even a twinkle in Isildur's eye, there were elves living in this part of the world, Sindar elves. And the first ever prince of Dol Amroth, the direct ancestor of Imrahil, is a guy called Galador. And Galador is one of the most interesting minor characters in the entire Legendarium because, along with his sister, Galador is the only half-elf ever described who isn't part of the whole Beren and Luthien, Tuor and Idril, Aragorn and Arwen triangle. I go into way more detail on this topic in this video, but basically, just over a thousand years before The Lord of the Rings, there was a nobleman of Gondor called Imrazor, and he fell in love with a Sylvan elf called Mithralas. Together they had two children, Galador and Gilmith, and Galador went on to become the first prince of Dol Amroth. Which of course means that Galador's direct descendant, Imrahil, also has a little bit of elven blood in his veins. We may assume that it would have been very much diluted over the 21 generations, but we're actually told that when Legolas first meets Prince Imrahil after the Battle of Pelennor Fields, he immediately perceives that Imrahil is no ordinary mortal, and he bows low out of respect for this elven heritage. Which does raise the question of why didn't Legolas perceive this elven heritage in Boromir? But that might just be a testament to how noble and incredible Prince Imrahil is. And much of what Prince Imrahil does in the story is given to Gandalf in the movies. But in the books, we are told that Imrahil arrives at Minas Tirith only a day after Pippin does. And Pippin watches him ride into the city with a company of the Swan Knights of Dol Amroth and 700 soldiers to aid in the defence of the capital. When Faramir is almost slain after the disaster at Osgiliath, it is Prince Imrahil who rides out with Gandalf to save his sister son. And when Denethor descends into madness, it is Imrahil who takes command. Although he does pretty immediately yield that command to Gandalf. Anyway, during the Battle of Pelennor Fields, Prince Imrahil rides out of the city with his knights to aid Eomer and the Rohirrim. And although so many people die in that battle, including many of the other Gondorian captains that Imrahil rides out with, we are told that Imrahil is entirely unscathed. He doesn't even take a scratch. After the battle, Imrahil is the one who perceives that Eowyn is still alive, and Imrahil is the first man of the city to recognise Aragorn as the king who has returned. He then takes part in the last debate and acts as one of the captains of the West in the final battle before the Black Gate, and after the ring is destroyed, Imrahil is present at the coronation of Aragorn and the burial of King Theoden where he builds a fast friendship with Rohan's new king, Eomer. In fact, Eomer goes on to marry Prince Imrahil's daughter. And when the story ends and the Fourth Age begins, Imrahil is still there as one of the chief advisors to King Elessar and one of the most important figures in Gondor. In fact, along with his nephew Faramir, Imrahil remains one of the king's chief commanders until he dies at the end of a 100 year long life. I guess there simply wasn't enough runtime in the Return of the King movie to give Prince Imrahil the spotlight that he deserves, but I find his character such a fascinating little wrinkle in the story of Gondor and its resistance against Sauron in the War of the Ring. And Prince Imrahil illuminates so much of the wider Gondorian country that we only get such a small glimpse of in the books and an even smaller glimpse of in the movies. 
So, there's my top 10 favourite characters who didn't make it into the movies. I hope you enjoyed it, and please share your thoughts and your own favourite characters in the comments below. And of course, to make sure you don't miss any future top 10 lists or any of my weekly First Age videos, hit subscribe if you haven't already, and don't forget to hit like and share this channel with your friends if you want to. But, as always, until next time, my dear friends, much love. Stay groovy, and Nevaya Melanine.